it's time to put on your finest suit. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. We've got a cool Gen 1 chainsaw case, my friends. Why am I so excited? You never see Gen 1s, so the true Gen 1s only have two latches on the front. They didn't get the back latch until Gen 2. Now, unfortunately, we're missing a latch, so this case is not that good. But what is inside of it is fantastic. Oh man, our hinges are pretty much shot too. <laughs> it's a white Les Paul Custom, my friends, but it's not. It's even more special than that. This is considered a tuxedo custom. It has the white top with black back and sides. Yeah, that's cruise control for cool. <laughs> I had one of these a long time ago, never realized I would never like see one again, but I was finally able to pick this one up to document. And you know what? Looking at this player's grade version helps me realize something. These were actually sprayed all white from the factory and then black on the back. How do I know that somebody hasn't refinished this? Because our serial number, it's the decal one. Now I suppose we should blacklight it too, just to be safe, but the tuxedo finish was a real thing. Now full disclosure, I don't know if it was actually called tuxedo by Gibson at the time. However, that's the nickname that has remained popular for these. So now that we know this is a relatively uncommon finish, were there any famous users? Like, should you know about this color? And the answer actually is yes. Don Dockin of Dockin used one of these in the late 70s. That's right, even though George Lynch usually steals the show from this band as far as cool signature guitars with like the kamikaze or the skeleton, Don did give notoriety to this particular finish. There used to be a YouTube link seeing him play one, but I was at least able to dig up these photos from 1979, where you can clearly see he's playing one of these tuxedo customs. So that's pretty cool because usually these rare limited edition colors, they don't necessarily have a notable person to back them up. They're just cool because they're rare. And hey, Dokken just released a new album today, so what a perfect tie-in. Go check it out if you want. So is this Dokken's long lost guitar? <laughs> well, I will say it's been refretted. It's got finish checking along the pancake body. It's definitely been used a lot. I, I don't know what his original serial number was. Uh, this one's definitely a bit more of a player. So if this is your first time seeing one, you're probably curious, how many of these did they make? Now we don't have like official numbers, but it's relatively accepted that there's maybe 50-ish. Typically the earliest you'll see this finish is 1974. Some of them actually have the 20th anniversary inlay at the 15th fret. That's how you know they were somewhere between 1974 and early 75. Most of them are still mahogany in 75. Other ones is kind of like this one. It'll have the maple neck due to 1975 kind of being a transition year. But most of these were made around 76, early 77. So that's why they'll have the maple necks. So in many ways, these are kind of similar to the Brazilian Rosewood Top Les Paul Customs. There were very few made, and most people don't even realize they existed as a color option, so to speak. But this actually did receive a reissue by Epiphone. It was called the Epiphone Black Bat Custom. They had really interesting pickups in it with that antique ivory top and the black back and sides. Here's a pro tip for these Gibson chainsaw cases if you ever buy a used guitar. Don't forget to check under here because sometimes you find some weird stuff that hides. For example, I found our missing latch, not that there's a way to reattach it, unfortunately. And then I found a mystery baggie of something that has completely decomposed. I have no clue what this is. I'm probably just gonna throw it away. Or better yet, leave it for the next guy. Because I had picked this one up thinking, well, we'll see how beat up it really is if I want to add it to my collection or not. So let's go ahead and throw it on the workbench to take an individual look at its parts and specs to see what might still be original before we get to a playing demo. Well, that took forever, but it's finally clean. There was just layers and layers of gunk. Now, I'm not trying to remove the history from it, just make it clean. When I had purchased this guitar, he actually had some Seymour Duncans in here with a push-pull pot set up, but he said in his listing that, hey, I'll restore it back to original if you want, and I went for that. But unfortunately, this is not back to original. This one is the correct T-top pickup that you would find in like 75, 76. It has the Williamsville stamp on it. So just a little bit of background history on that. Moog Music bought a factory in Williamsville, New York, which is a suburb of Buffalo in 1971. And in 1975, that's when Moog was purchased by Norlin, the same parent company that owns Gibson. So for a short period of time, Gibson amplifiers and Cordovox instruments were actually created in that New York plant. So it's believed that some pickups and other guitar electronics and sub-assemblies might have been produced there as well. Hence why they got the Williamsville stamping. However, going to the bridge pickup, that's a 1981 Tim Shaw PAF. Definitely not original to a 76 custom, but to be fair here, that's worth the same or more than a Eric Correct T-Top. 
The pickups read 7.4 in the circuit for the bridge, 7.63 in the neck, and middle position 3.76, all within spec. Here's what our neck pickup cavity looks like. Everything's looking good here. And here's our bridge pickup cavity. So the main thing you're looking at here is the taped off areas. If you see a full finish in here during this era, usually that means it's a sign of refinish. However, somebody that knows what they're doing will also tape that off to mimic how they did it back then. But also looking inside here, you can see the second pancake layer right underneath our maple top that you don't normally see. Then right after this mahogany body, there's another one. So when we're talking this little crack right here, that is just a seam line, not necessarily a crack. Sometimes the pancake bodies do separate, but there is no separation there. But everything's looking good so far. So just to recap, this has a maple top with a small layer of maple right before you join onto half a body's width of mahogany. Then you get another layer of maple that's very small, like the one up here. And then you get another slab of mahogany. And that's what creates your body from about 1969 till about 1976. That's when they start to do away with that center one. So this is one of the older ones that has this. However, the layer right here that you don't normally see continues on into the early 80s. I don't know the exact stopping date for that. It wouldn't surprise me if it's 1982 when other things start to change, though. Finding a clean tuxedo has been difficult. There's currently one other one on reverb, but it's got a bunch of finish checking on the top that I just don't really like. This one doesn't necessarily have that, but it's got all the other nicks and dings and whatnot from play. And you've got some discolorations from where the plastics kind of hid the finish from the sun and other yellowing agents. Full disclosure, this neck pickup ring has been glued back together. It's worth noting that the output and the jack plate have both been replaced as well as their screws. However, miraculously, the switch tip looks correct to me. So does the poker chip. The knobs are also vintage correct. However, they are quite beat up on their top hats. They're chipped in many areas. That is kind of common. Still have their correct labelings. And here's a look at our pick guard. Nice and used, but not overly abused. Check out this bridge. He's worn through the plating and into the actual metal itself. Nice job, Mr. Player. And then we still have the original tailpiece as well. Full weight gold. We have a three-piece maple neck with an ebony fretboard. So how can you tell that this thing has been refretted? Namely because we do not have the binding running over top of this. That's called a fret nib. So whenever those are gone, usually that means the guitar has been refretted. And you can also tell because these are just much larger frets than normal. However, there's something else that's been replaced on here. Did you catch it? I'm convinced this whole inlay has been replaced because look at how much color and movement this one has. Most 70s inlays don't look like that. I mean, it's still real shell material, right? But look at all the rest of them. They've got decent color and movement, but you can tell this one's not like the rest. It's actually quite nice. Occasionally inlays can fall out and you can see somebody didn't install it very good. It cracked, but they're like, yeah, whatever. Glued it in there anyways. You can see a small gap right here, but they did a good job on the refret. Typically ebony boards are a little bit brittle to refret and you'll get like some chip out along them. This one, I only saw it in a few very select areas, such as right here. Usually when you refret, you change the nut, and that is the case here. Looks like this one measures 1.7 inches, increasing to 2.065, 0.86 for fret neck depth, and one by the 12th. But remember, you're starting to hit the heel. 70s necks in general are more so a 60s slim taper. Next up, we've got our headstock. We've got that awesome golden Gibson logo, which if you don't know, that's just the yellowing of the lacquer. That's why in areas like right there, you can actually still see the nice mother of pearl underneath it. That part does not age itself. Full disclosure about this tuner, you can't actually tighten it all the way because this doesn't appear to actually grip the tuner perfectly. It works as is. However, you probably should take this washer and thin it out a bit to make it fully secure like the rest. A little bit of thread sticking out past the top. It was something played that heavily. Not too bad of a condition for your truss rod. The MR is the initials of whoever did the fret job on this initially out of the factory. Here's the truss rod cover itself. It reads Les Paul Custom. You can see the top loop is cracked. But other than that, okay shape. Thankfully, despite all the wear and tear, the neck is perfectly straight. And when I'm talking straight, I'm not talking, oh, there's a bow in the neck, I need to use the truss rod. I'm talking curves like this in the neck that you can't fix with a truss rod adjustment. That's what you gotta watch out for. 
because it's not as easy to fix that. However, I did notice, as is typical on these older bridges, it has collapsed, meaning you've lost the radius of the bridge. The radius of that is supposed to match the radius of your fretboard. Usually what happens is somebody decks their tailpiece down like this, but they string it up normally, and the downward pressure of that over so many years will cause the bridge to go from this to that. So what that affects is your two middle strings. Sometimes they'll buzz, which I am getting that a little bit on the open string, and then like a little bit in this area. So, I mean, if you want 100% perfect playability and intonation, you probably want to go ahead and just replace that bridge. However, so far, I'm actually really impressed with the way this one plays. It's set up just right. Not too much buzz, but not too high. And the larger frets are a nice refresh on these, because if you're not used to the low wide Norland era frets, you're probably not going to like them at first. So this one's been modernized in that aspect, which is kind of funny because the last tuxedo I had back in the carpet era was also refretted. Something about this finish just says, play the crap out of me. Now we move on to the backside. Again, this also cleaned up pretty nicely, but you can tell it's got buckle worming, rash, finish worn areas, dents and dings all over. But now let's look at our electronics. The pots all date to 1976. Those are still original to this guitar. Actually pretty early 76. That one's the 10th week. This one's the 13th. Looks like he's the 10th as well. And a 13th. Okay, I see what happened here. Usually, these two will match and these two will match, but I bet when he put the two original pots in, he got them flipped. And these are not the stock capacitors, but they're probably better than what came stock, which is those little orange ceramic discs. But that looks good for this being the original finish. And here's our toggle switch cavity. Nothing too much to look at here. And our strap buttons are about what I would expect from this era in both locations. But when I saw this, I was a little scared. The heel crack? Sometimes there is a little bit of movement and it's not that big of a deal, but if you continue on to the rest of the guitar, there is your pancake seam line. So that follows all along here. Again, it's not a complete break. It's just lacquer tends to sink into those. Not on every example, mind you. I mean, yes, this technically is blemished because of this. Usually it's not quite as apparent, but trust me, this is far from the worst I've ever seen. However, that lines up perfectly for the pancake, so I'm no longer worried. Because I was looking right here, and it almost looks like there might have been a small touch-up. And it is common for white and black finished customs to chip right here. I'm wondering if somebody did touch it up. It's either that, or it's just a bunch of gunk that was on the neck is also built up right there. So it black lights differently, but I'll show you that here in a second. This whole neck was just caked. I mean, you see how it's still hazy right here? I couldn't get everything off. And usually that's what makes a neck feel sticky. Thankfully, this one's back to being mostly glossy after my cleaning and polish job. But you can appreciate, he wore through not only the black layer, but also the white layer right here. That is a significant feel difference. This one is only down to the white layer. You don't even notice that. Same thing with the edge of the neck. That's actually really cool, and I'm glad I documented this one, because I never realized that it just started life as all white, and then they sprayed the black over top of it. Knowing that makes me think it would be pretty easy for the custom shop to recreate these today. So there you go. That painted over series in Gibson is actually lore correct, and they weren't stealing from Fender. We've got a tiny little volute here. And then our Grover tuners. You couldn't see it before because there was a bunch of gunk all over it. This started life with Schaller tuners. You can see the filled in holes that they touched up with a little bit of black. And here's our serial number. They only used these for roughly three years. Late 1975, 1976, and through about mid-1977. And this is, again is a seam line for our headstock wing. Lots of nicks and dings up here. Here we are under black light. You can check out those knobs glowing the way they should. Finishes nice and even along the top. You can see a little bit of sweat absorption in this area, but even in regular lighting situation, that's kind of a more brown color. Some people's sweat does that to the alpine white finish. This is what we're looking for here. You want an even glow in between it all. And that's exactly what I'm seeing. The camera just kind of over adjusts for that white top. Here you can see the slight seam line separation and again, more sweat absorption. It stocks looking good. Except for, of course, those chips we were talking about. You also have that around each tuner. Likely happened during the tuner swap out. And now the backside, also looking good. Here's what I was talking about earlier with how the finish doesn't quite glow as much around the heel. 
However, you can also see right here where it was all gunked up and I couldn't get it all off. It has a similar appearance. So I really do believe it's probably just gunk that's built up and I couldn't get it cleaned off. Let's just say there was a small touch up there. However, I don't suspect that the neck actually broke off. If it did, you would see a visible disturbance right here. and All that is dirt and grime I couldn't get off. The neck black light's really cool though. You've worn through the clear coat, so you can only see the ebony finish. That's why it appears really dark. It's the clear coat that ages, not necessarily the color. But then the white, obviously, it glows a little bit brighter under UV, so it just kind of stands out. It's kind of a cool, almost camo-like effect. But you've got wear up and down this entire neck, including the other side. No brakes, cracks, or repairs. You can easily see those tuner touch-up areas had you had missed them earlier. All said and done, 10 pounds, 9.5 ounces. Yeah, that's about average, 10, 10 and a half for this era. Sometimes they can go up to 14, but that's a pretty rare occurrence. Let's go ahead, plug it in, and hear how this one sounds. Got a nice mellow hard rock tone to it. The bridge Tim Shaw actually sounds pretty nice. <laughs> position. Let's kick on some dirt. Now that we know all about this rare tuxedo custom, what are my final thoughts? 
Yeah, I totally understand why this thing got played as much as it did. These pickups sound phenomenal, even if that's not the pickup set that's been in it the longest. I'm not sure what the previous owner to this one had in it before those Seymour Duncans were put in, but this T-Top and Tim Shaw work incredibly well together. So I'm thankful that I was able to get another one of these to document in my more current style. Unfortunately, condition-wise, I, I don't think this is the right one for my museum collection, but my goodness. That's mainly because this needs to be in the hands of somebody that's going to take it out and continue to gig it. I wouldn't feel right holding this one back from the world. Not only do you get some docking vibes out of this thing, but I got some Zack Wild bullseye feel from it as well, because hey, it's white and black. You know, his has the whole bullseye thing. I think his was like an 81 custom, if I remember correctly. But on top of that, of course we can channel Randy Rhodes. Nobody has to know that the back is black. We can just rock it as the cream custom that it is. So all right, Troglodytes, if you're interested in being the next owner of this one, you can find it for sale on my website, troglysguitarshow.com. But I hope you enjoyed getting to document this one. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.